Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if this is the first time that you've tuned into one of the CCI's online events, welcome. If you've already attended other talks, workshops, or any of the activities, welcome back. Um, my name is Andrew Mallinson, and I'm an artist and researcher and member of Venice Internet, and I'll be co-hosting today's event. We're really, really excited to be hosting this event as part of the Arts SU's Trans Awareness Week. Um, so thank you for joining us for the symposium. Um, before I jump in, just want to give you a few details about the session um, and introduce you to the CCI and if you're new to this space. Um, so the CCI stands for the Creative Computing Institute and it's the first institute being set up at University of the Arts London, which offers innovative new courses at the intersection of creativity and computational technologies, research opportunities and a public platform to explore computer science and creative practice. So as part of CCI's public program, um, we've had the chance to run the um, course called Queering Voice AI Trans Centre Design, which was created in collaboration with CCI, Femis Internet, which I'm a part of, um, and conversation designer Cami Roncone. And that is what we're here to discuss today. Um, so just to give you a little rundown of how things are going to go for the next hour and a half. First, we'll be hearing from Cami about their research and how the workshop came to be. Uh, followed by that, we'll watch a short film where we're going to introduce you to the prototype, um, which will be really exciting. And then after that, there'll be a panel discussion with the participants, followed by a Q&A, which you can use a slide to send your questions into. Um, so just to give you a little bit more information on Cami, um, Cami is a conversation designer and researcher who explores the risks and opportunities for trans and queer people in AI. Uh, Cami utilizes her MSc in Management of Innovation from Goldsmiths University at London to develop design requirements for trans competent voice AI. So, now I'm going to pass over to Cami, and we're going to hear about their incredible work um, and how everything came to be. So yeah, Cami. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, all right, so I'm gonna talk today a little bit about um, the research that led um, to this workshop. Um, so the workshop was grounded on my research um, where I explored um, the needs and experiences of trans user voice AI, um, and specifically voice assistants such as Siri or Alexa. Um, so this may seem a little niche, however, it stems from, it stems from an understanding of two things. First, um, technological artifacts such as voice um, AI don't exist in a vacuum, but are rather um, artifacts within a system where the ideologies held by designers and developers, um, the economic um, or the financial drives for developing technology um, are replicated through um, technological devices and have tangible social consequences. So um, to give a more concrete, um, a more concrete example to um, how technology um, replicates ideology, there is um, extensive work um, within academia which critiques uh, voice assistants as they portray um, voice assistant personas as uh, mostly cis women. So in essence, uh, by voice assistants having default personalities with cis women, they associate women with um, positions of servitude. Combined with the technical limitations of voice assistants, it also associates women uh, with mistake making. So this is an example of how the ideologies, conscious or unconscious within developers, um, may lead to systems of inequality. Um, and just to talk a bit more about um, the specific example of voice assistants and their portrayal of women, um, Heather Woods uh, expands this analysis and even goes forth to say that the feminine persona in voice assistant is not um, a coincidence, but is rather used in order to ease mainstream users' anxieties around having a device which collects data in intimate spaces uh, such as their home. So in essence, by replicating uh, these systems of inequality, users are in fact more comfortable. Um, and this is an example where they could be interrupting system of oppression, systems of oppression, but rather it is uh, replicated. Um, so um, to talk 
a little bit more about why voice really understand that these devices don't just exist in their current stage of development, but also think about them in how they will develop in the coming years. So here you can see um, some statistics around the level of adoption or the forecasted level of adoption uh, for voice assistance, which is it's quite huge and it's also global. Um, and also a quote from Microsoft's 2019 uh, voice report which essentially describes how voice assistants, as Microsoft um, foresees it, are to develop into a singular digital assistant capable of engaging in complex conversations that will be embedded in the lives of users to, the, to their day to day. It will be more interconnected with the internet of things, and it'll be essentially very, very intimately engaging with users while automating some of their daily tasks. So when you think about voice assistance in this forecasted future, you start to understand that actually these technologies have a very, very high level of social impact. Um, so like I said before, there's ample research into the subject of voice assistance and gender. However, most of this fails to include trans people in analysis, and it also operates within trans exclusive notions of gender. So when I say trans exclusive notions of gender, what I'm referring to is a couple of things. This was very well described by Oz Keys, who's an incredible researcher focusing on the intersection between gender and human computer interaction. So trans exclusive notions of gender see gender as binary. There's only two options and that is man and woman. It sees gender as immutable. Once you're assigned a category, that person cannot um, alter that category. And thirdly, that category is uh, assigned through a person's physiology. So it's normally based on a person, person's uh, genitals. So given these notions, trans people and their needs uh, and the potential harm that voice assistance may cause um, has, is a subject that has really um, lacked in research. Although there has been some research and some initiative uh, to include trans people in the conversation of um, voice AI and gender, the most prominent of which is Q the Genderless Voice. So um, Q the Genderless Voice is a project that was developed by Vice Media um, in partnership with Copenhagen Pride. In essence, um, what they developed was a voice that was deemed genderless. The vocal range of this um, synthetic voice that they created was in the middle of the voices, the vocal range that they deemed as male, which was quite low, and the vocal range that they deemed female, which was quite high. Their goal was for voice assistant developers, or is for voice assistant developers such as Apple, Amazon, um, Google, to um, adopt these in order for non-binary and trans people to have representation within their voice assistants. Um, I will discuss the adequacy of this representation in a bit, but for now, I just wanna highlight the fact that this focus assumes that representation is the sole feature that is desired by trans users, overriding any other changes in design. So I conduct my project to fill this gap in academic research. I interviewed trans and non-binary users of voice assistants addressing the research question, what are the needs and experiences of trans and non-binary users of voice assistants? And what I found um, was that trans people require structural changes from their devices. And these changes are, um, these changes go beyond the needs for representation. So the four main user needs that I found was first and foremost, designing for trans-specific privacy considerations. So privacy was the main issue that um, trans users that I interviewed had. The second is developing features for trans-specific purposes. So developing devices that actually address trans-specific needs. The first one is creating representative and gender-affirming gender personas. So indeed, trans people did want to see themselves represented. And fourth, 
Um, basing the developing the development of these features and the development of voice assistance in a grounded and participatory design process that involves trans people in decision making when developing these devices. So um, I will dive a little bit deeper into um, what each of these requirements um, mean. So um, the main concern that I found uh, in my research was actually not a concern around representation, but rather a concern around privacy. Participants, in essence, felt a huge lack of agency around their data collection, the distribution of their data, and even um, their concerns even got to the point of feeling that their data may be used to manipulate the, their behavior and engage more intimately with their devices. Um, in essence, Participants didn't really know when their devices were listening to them, and they had fears around how their data may be used. This, um, these concerns, uh, just to give a little bit of a statistic, 100% um, of the 15 participants that I interviewed had concerns with their devices, and this compares to the 41% of concerns reported um, by users in Microsoft. Um, 2019 voice report. So you can see that um, at least the population of trans uh, people that I interviewed had a much heightened sense of concern around uh, their devices. And I would venture to say that these concerns are not unfounded. There are um, a couple of academics that uh, talk a little bit about the risks within um, data collection and data use in voice assistance. First off, I'm going to talk a little bit about emotional AI, the rise of empathetic media. So designers um, or developers rather have utilized voice assistance. Um, and this is a technology that hasn't been fully adopted. However, many mainstream uh, developers, including Amazon, had start, have started um, engaging with emotional analytics uh, for the development of their device. So essentially, um, what emotional analytics is, is um, noting signals within users' voices to categorize um, these signals into specific um, emotional categories. So essentially, by starting to understand um, how the user is feeling in regarding to their voice, um, this information can be used to deliver personalized responses that um, increase user engagement. So it essentially um, heightens the social nature of the interactions between users and voice assistants, and it increases engagement. This could also be used um, potentially for voice assistants to um, sell things to users or for voice assistants to um, guide users towards particular information. So in essence, emotional analytics adds an effective layer to users' data profiles. So not, not only are voice assistants gathering information as um, maybe they are in uh, visual interfaces, but it is they are also, but, um, not yet, but the technology exists for this to also add an emotional layer to data profiles. Um, so this really does show the incentive of developers to um, heighten the use of voice assistance as data collection tools. Um, another one of users' concerns relied around a lack of transparency, not knowing where the data was um, heading and how it was used. And this is also not unfounded. Um, developers have um, and do share uh, user data with third parties, with users' concerns. Um, and although they only, um, uh, they only, um, send user data into the cloud once a wake word is detected. There has been issues with this in the past where users have been recorded without the wake word being used. Data has been analyzed by human agents um, and data has also been shared with the government in court cases. So um, users' concerns are not unfounded. It could very much be argued that privacy concerns exist for any user. And this is true. However, there are also trans-specific vulnerabilities to breaches of privacy. The truth of the matter is that trans identities are um, politicized. 
there is uh, much of a hostile environment towards trans people and they experience disproportionate physical violence. For this reason, digital visibility through data may potentially identify a person as trans and aggravate risks of harm for these users. These users. So um, breaches of privacy might, might, in essence, heighten the risk of um, harm experienced by trans people. And so for this reason, the user need identified for privacy is that um, designers must, must offer a shift in power relations where users are not bound to offer data by default, but rather can autonomously opt into providing information if desired. As it stands right now, data is for the most part collected and users may opt out. It's quite rigid and it's, it's not a service design that really enables user agency over their data use. So it's very important for developers to incorporate this requirement into service design and that they offer users an easeful ability to personalize their privacy settings, modify their data, and even delete their data. And being able to do this without the risk of not being able to utilize the devices. So essentially, what this user need advocates for is the unsanctioned opting out of data collection. Um, this was the main user need, and um, it is where most of uh, the users that I interviewed where most of their concerns lied. The second user need um, was around trans-specific purposes. Uh, people that I interviewed were really interested in, in utilizing voice assistant technology to improve um, their uh, trans-specific experiences. So potentially um, they would like voice assistants that can assist them with healthcare, that can assist them around st uh, street safety, and that can also connect them to trans media. All of these are, um, topics in which trans people experience um, disparities. And these um, purposes show examples of how voice assistants can actually be used to uh, help bridge disparities experienced uh, by trans, pe trans people. The third user need um, was representative and gender affirming personas. So I found that indeed, the trans um, population that I interviewed was interested in having representation. This wasn't as important for the most part as privacy, but it was something that users wanted. Also, users were interested, especially in the transition to voice assistants with complex uh, conversational capacities. They wanted devices that properly addressed their gender. So I'm gonna dive a little bit into um, the subject of representation and then gender affirming uh, personas. In terms of representation, although this was something that was wanted, it was not desired without first meeting privacy concerns. As one participant put it, it basically is the same system, but with a different voice. The reason for um, users not wanting representation without meeting first privacy concerns is because representation may serve as a surveillance trap. So in a similar way that female personas may ease users' anxieties um, towards adoption, representation could um, ease uh, trans and non-binary users' um, use and intimate use of voice assistants. And if they have identified these as devices that they don't fully trust, this really goes against their foundational needs. Um, a second thought on representation that users brought up is that it can be seen as a distraction from other structural changes and cause confusion through the belief that by solving for issues in representation, um, developers would also be solving for all the array of um, issues that trans people have with their devices. This very much is uh, echoes this very much echoes notions of uh, critical trans politics, as discussed by um, Professor Dean Spade where um, trans-specific inclusion in harmful system is seen as validating, while not actually addressing the array of needs um, experienced by perhaps the most marginalized of trans people who hold other intersectional identities. 
In essence, when it comes to representation, although this is desired, it is for the most part only desired when combined with wider structural changes, namely changes around privacy. And this was very similar when talking about um, gender affirmation. Um, gender affirmation was um, seen again as desired in the, in the transition towards conversational capacities. Users would like their um, genders to be you know, properly addressed. Um, however, um, given that this would increase uh, the visibility of users' gender, this again stresses the importance of privacy. Users want to have their privacy concerns solved before having user-facing um, design that is representative and that is affirming. And the reason why trans users may be particularly vulnerable to this sort of surface level fixes is because users discussed experiencing a huge sense of an unsafety in the majority of environments that they engaged in. So on their day to day, they experienced um, feeling disrespected, having their gender invalidated, and this ranged from this level to also feeling a sense of physical unsafety. They described a minority of spaces that were safe, and these were described by all users. And these spaces were categorized by relationships where people um, validate their gender and where they can bring them themselves to be their full selves without having to switch anything about them. So if these spaces are so rare and devices are now mimicking these spaces without addressing the potential privacy risks that trans people may experience in these devices, there essentially, there exists the potential for exploiting the hardships experienced by trans people in order to lure them into more intimate use. And this, of course, is ethically questionable. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to uh, talk about the next user need. But before I do that, um, I will um, say one last thing about representation, which is that although current attempts have focused on the idea of a gender neutral voice that I interviewed actually were wild, wi widely critiquing of this notion. And the main critique had to do with the fact that um, this sort of design is still uh, perpetuating the idea that voice is linked to a gender. So by um, saying uh, a gender neutral voice falls in this range, a male voice falls in this range, it erases the existence of say, um, females that have low voices, gender neutral folks or non-binary people that have high voices and everything in between. In essence, a solution as uh, described by participants would rely on having a wide variety of voices, none of which are gendered. In this way, participants would be able to choose the voice and the gender of their voice assistant persona without perpetuating the idea that a specific voice, which in this case represents the body, is linked to any specific gender. So lastly, um, the last user need um, was participatory design. Users wanted trans people to be involved in the process of development and for their feedback to be incorporated throughout the process of design. In an ideal sense, participants described um, voice assistants that are grassroots, that are developed by trans people, and that are for trans people. Um, this uh, would be very much more um, be parallel to users' experiences of safer spaces and would thus increase user trust. In order to address um, issues of potential uh, power misdistribution, some participants also suggested a cooperative structure in order for all voices of a variety of trans people in the development of uh, voice AI to be accounted for um, equally. And so this is an example of how um, technology might be uh, leveraged by communities in order to um, empower their own community. Users that would engage in uh, with voice assistants that cover all of these requirements have full autonomy over how their data is used and how much data they share. But in the event that these 
devices are also purposed towards um, benefiting the trans community and are developed by members of the trans community, users may actually feel um, much more insight and much more of a desire to share their data, knowing that ultimately it supports the functioning of a device that might provide relief for the wider trans community. So finally, one last point being, um, oh, actually, here is uh, the overview of all of the trans needs. Again, privacy, trans-specific purposes, representative and gender-affirming personas, and participatory design. Lastly, um, why does this matter? When you analyze technology and when you analyze uh, voice assistance um, from a structural standpoint, it is much easier to understand how um, these devices and this technology is interrelated directly with the material conditions of trans people. Privacy concerns are physical concerns for trans people. And for this reason, it is important. Also, this research um, enables um, advocacy for reform within the industry. And it also um, develops, uh, it also may serve as a framework for um, grassroots groups of developers, of trans developers to actually utilize technology um, in order to not only mitigate these risks, but actually leverage technology to improve the embodied well being of trans people. In essence, these um, user needs may be utilized for voice assistance to be developed in a way that um, provides material relief for trans people. Our workshop was an attempt uh, to develop a working prototype based on these requirements. Um, and our outcomes represent how different technology might look when developed by the community of users that it aims to serve. Um, it aims to show how voice assistant technology can support the embodied well being of trans and non binary people. That's all. Thank you guys so much. Thank you very much, Cami. Thank you so, so much. Um, I'd just like to extend a personal huge thanks to Cami for their incredible work. Um, and it's been really, really just an incredible experience to develop this project with you. So thank you very, very much. Um, if you do have any specific questions for Cami, you can send them through the Slido and we'll get to them at the Q&A section at the end. So do send them through if you have anything specific. Um, but we're gonna press forward. Um, and now we are going to watch a film that shows you the process of the workshop. Um, and all that it entailed and all the incredible participants um, and introduce you to the prototype itself. So um, yeah, sit back and enjoy. Conceived by Feminist Internet and Conversation, Queering Voice AI Trans Centre Design ran from the 21st to the 25th of September at University of the Arts London's Creative Computing Institute. The design team, which was formed through an open call, was comprised of majority trans and non-binary people. The goal of the course was to develop a prototype voice interface with a trans-specific purpose, introducing participants to trans-competent approaches to voice interface design and the potential that this technology has in supporting trans and non-binary people. The prototype was built from the ground up over the course of the week, beginning with a lecture from diversity and inclusion specialist Tajal Hamilton giving participants context on current trans issues. Because of the issues Taja raised, as a team, we felt that it was important to centre trans joy in the purpose of the device. In the end, choosing to have it connect users to media created by trans and non-binary people. Over the next few days, we began building the device, utilising a set of trans-competent design standards. Artist Danielle Braithwaite Shirley gave a lecture on their practice, which seeks to archive the black trans experience through technological environments. Danielle's considerations around the terms in which you interact with their work, by disclosing your gender and race, helped us form our own specific terms and conditions for the device. From here, we began to create a persona for the device, giving it a personality that felt true to its purpose. Utilising conversation design skills, we began to create sample dialogue, testing our interactions between each other before testing the device with our user, Cherub, a trans woman from Seattle. After interactions with Cherub, we began to build out our conversation as a flowchart, where each possible route through the conversation could be mapped out. 
After repeated testing, it was time to build the prototype device. The device was built using web-based platform VoiceFlow, which allows users to create and program voice interfaces without any prior coding experience. After the design was complete and we had recorded and uploaded our audio for the device, it was time to meet our prototype. So now, I would like to introduce you to SIP. Hello, welcome to SIP. This is a pro trans voice interface aimed at connecting the trans community to media created by trans people. Have you heard about our project before? Yeah, I have. Amazing. Would you like us to refresh your memory? That'd be great. SIP was created by a team of majority trans and non-binary people. Our purpose is to connect trans and non-binary users to amazing media created by their community. SIP is a participatory design project developed by a team formed through an open call for a course at the University of the Arts London's Creative Computing Institute and tested with a white trans woman based in Seattle. While our team encompasses a range of nationalities, races, abilities, sexual and gender identities, we are aware of the limitations within our team, most notably the absence of black trans people. We won't develop future it out involving black trans people in the process. SIB is a work in progress. Ed? Yeah, let's go. Fab, time to personalise your SIB. Would you like to chat with Voice 1 Voice 2 Voice 3 Yeah, could I have Voice 1? Thank you for that. Would you like to set a gender for your SIB? It doesn't need to have a gender. An agenda won't change its personality. Yeah. Let's do this. What gender would you like for your SIB? Can she be trans femme? We are now generating your persona. Oh, congratulations. No offense to the other sibs, but you chose the best one. I want to help connect you to transmedia. But first, can I ask for some personal deets? Sure. Amazing. I can be used without storing any of your information, so no pressure to say yes to any of this. You can always say, protect my data to come back and edit or delete your information. Would you like me to remember your name and pronouns? Yeah, that'd be great. Beautiful. What's your name then? My name's Finn. And your pronouns? My pronouns are they then. Sounds amazing, Finn. I like to call all of my friends Hun. Would you like me to use another name for you? Yeah, sure. Cute. What can I use? Uh, yeah, call me Hun. I love it. Storing our conversations will help me remember your preferences for next time. Is it alright if I do this? Yeah, sure. Alright, excellent. One last thing. Are you over 18? I use this to filter content. Yeah, I am. Perfect, hun. We're all done with that. Phew! Now, would you like to access movies, music, or podcasts? Um, can I have a film? Ooh, exciting! Good choice, Finn. I'm in the mood for a film, too. What kind of genre did you want to watch? I have some great films for romance, horror, and sci-fi. Um, let's go for sci-fi. Oh my gosh, I know an out-of-this-world film. There's a movie titled Transfinite. It's composed of seven standalone stories. Would you like to hear more? Yeah, please. I can tell you more about the plot, the director, or just send you a link to watch it. What's it going to be? Can I hear about the plot? So... The movie is an hour and ten minutes long. It explores power. The power to protect, to teach, to love, and to thrive. It's dark, funny, and visually expressive. Are you interested in that link? That sounds great, yeah. Enjoy it! I've been told I have great taste. I have more recommendations, if you allow me. Yeah, that sounds good. Alright, what genre were you interested in? Can you find me a romance film? Ah, oh, I love a romance. There's a great film called So Pretty. It's about four queer and trans kids in New York. Want to know more? Yeah, that sounds fab. Okay, well, So Pretty is directed by and starring trans and non-binary people. It's loosely based on the 1980s German novel So Schön and has been described as, quote, a quietly radical film about queers, femininity, trans people, and utopia. Would you like me to send you its link? 
Yeah, please do. All sent. You're gonna love it. Is there anything else I can do? Uh, no. I think that's everything. Thanks. All right, hun. I'll be around if you need me. Until next time. Sorry, everyone, I forgot I was muted. Um, uh, that was our prototype. I really hope you enjoyed the film. Um, as noted at the end of the film there, if you'd like to interact with the prototype, you can head to bit.ly forward slash hello sib and test an interaction for yourself. Um, but I thought this would be a nice space. I'm sure a lot of you have a lot of questions. So I thought we could just um, give everyone like 60 seconds to send through some questions through the Slido, and then we'll get to them when we get to QA. But I just am um, conscious that you might have some questions now and just to write them down if you have them. So yeah, we'll have 60 seconds and then we'll come back for a panel discussion with the participants. forgetting that I'm on mute, the internet. Um, so um, welcome back. Uh, now we're going to meet some of the participants from the workshop and hear more about their perspectives. But before we do that, I'll just give you a quick introduction. Um, so joining us today, we have Finn. Finn is a second year graphic design student at Central St. Martins. And we have Joe. Joe studied sculpture at Camberwell College of Arts, and Joe is currently working as a full stack developer for Twine, and they are passionate about the intersection of technology and creativity. And last but certainly not least, we have our test user for SIB, the wonderful Cherub. Uh, Cherub is a trans filmmaker and college student based in Seattle, Washington. And it's currently very, very early for Cherub, so I'd like to extend extra thanks to Cherub for joining us at this time. Um, so we're just going to dive straight in. Um, and to get things started, I'm just going to throw a question out to all of you. Um, why did we choose to connect users to transmedia? Why was that important for us? I don't know who it's like. Um, I think when we started the discussions between the group, it was really evident that we were going to either work within kind of transmedia or uh, safety issues for for trans people in terms of different areas they can use and what makes places accessible um, or sort of in terms of trans healthcare which is uh, a big thing for a lot of people uh, and be a platform to give information and I think when we were discussing it um, as uh, a team that is a, a trans centered space and involves trans people there was a lot of conversation around like well if we're making this product and we have this opportunity as as a trans-centric team, why don't we use it to platform something that actually brings us joy, as opposed to something that is concerned with uh, what I think is, is too often portrayed in the way that trans people uh, are talked about in the media, which is uh, either the murder of black trans women or the levels at which we're not getting healthcare we need or a demonization of so many aspects of our politicized selves really and for us to be able to make something that is just about things that we love i think a lot of us really really wanted to do um 
I don't know if you two have something to add. Yeah, I think that also to have a to have a voice assistant be able to just directly connect people to trans and queer media um, is like really phenomenal because I I think that more often than not, um, especially within like algorithms and stuff right, we're not really prioritized, we're pushed to the bottom. Um, so it kind of cuts out the whole like, okay, how much research do I need to do to just find like a good queer film? Or, um, and, and I, I feel like also what we were able to do is such a small scope of what SIB has the potential to be too. Um, SIB can have like a whole database of queer and trans media. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I think that's really, really important um, that we, we have access to things that bring us joy and that we see ourselves in. Yeah, I, um, I completely agree. Um, I think for me, when, when we were making this design, design decision, um, just so the people at home were aware, there were three topics. It was like Finn was saying, trans media, um, public space and healthcare. And I don't know if for me, transmedia was the first thing that I thought of, but um, mine was more of a selection of what I don't want to do. And um, I think a lot of people out there can like agree with me that like trans people are tired. We're exhausted from multitude of trauma this year. You know, we've got COVID, we've in Britain, we've got the Gender Recognition Act, we've got JK Rowling and the TERFs and they're winning. And I'm 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 exhausted and, and I was sitting there at something nine o'clock in the morning talking about what is essentially trans trauma, you know, the medical uh, NHS and the safety that we have on the street. And trauma has become so synonymous with transness in almost un, unable to unpick where my trauma starts, <laughs> where my transness starts. And I just, the idea of spending a whole week, um, I don't know if I could have done it, if I'm being really honest, like a whole week of just focusing on something traumatic. And then sort of what Cherub was saying, um, I don't know if there is a centralized place. Like if I Google rom-com right now, I do not know how many pages in I would have to go before I would even see something that wasn't heteronormative. And mm -hmm. in that sense, like, I think I like definitely found, um, because, you know, transness wasn't something that I knew about when I was younger. Um, it wasn't part of like, uh, the community I got brought up in that you can feel, it can feel really gatekeepy, right? That transness is this sort of other world and I don't know how to access it. And I think having something centralized where you don't have to have, you know, Judith Butler background in artistic and gender theory just to access something is like really important. I think another thing too is that um, so much queer media or, um, ideas about, ideas presented to the general public about what it means to be trans and queer are not made by trans and queer people. They're made by cishet people, um, and predominantly cishet white people. So to be able to connect uh, users with uh, trans and queer media that is made by trans and queer people, um, I think is also really important. Mm -hmm. And I think also when when we were discussing it, we did we had lots of conversations about what what does trans media mean, what's included within those um, boundaries, mm -hmm. and it was it was really nice actually through the process and through making the prototype, we got to do lots of discussion about like oh I've seen this it's really cool or like this is interesting but like might not fit into these categories, mm -hmm. and we were able almost to have a human interaction that was was like what we wanted. To, people to be able to interact with SIB um, in the same manner, which I think was really interesting. Um, and I think, like Cherub said, once SIB as, as both a concept and a program have the potential to go so much farther and give the user so much control over all this information um, and around 
having it centered on trans people. Like Cherub said, it, making it top of the list, making it the first thing that users are able to access, um, as opposed to pages and pages after, if you can find it at all. Um, yeah, just to, I think what was what you've all said is so incredible. And I think for for us, it was very clear as soon as we hit that, this is what we're going to do. It, it just clicked into place, didn't it? It was, this is it. Like, it just, to send to TransJoy, to connect users to Transmedia, just felt like the right decision. And there was no questioning it after we'd made that decision. Um, but Finn, I know you and I were um, kind of, when we split off into teams at one point, um, to give everyone some awareness, um, Finn and I and a few of the other participants were tasked with trying to find Transmedia. And it was actually quite a difficult task, um, specifically with the requirements that we were looking for. Um, yeah, it was, I don't know if you want to speak more about like, just that like process of actually trying to find things. It's, it's quite, yeah. Yeah, I think, like you said, because we were obviously only working with the smaller parameters of, of this working prototype. And even then, trying to find options that you could provide for different genres for different um, with these different requirements that a user could pick like most of the ones we ended up finding were just things that we knew of anyway um, so like one of the the examples in the film is uh, so pretty which is one of my favorite films which is why I suggested it but I was only aware of that because someone else who's also trans had told me yo you need to look at this um, so I think there is still this this thing where these this media is passed from person to person. There isn't uh, a kind of centralized way of accessing it. And also with the, with almost the pre-vetting of knowing that someone else has watched it because this media can so often center around trauma and be like, be things that I might not want to watch, even if they're uh, focused on trans issues and have trans characters in them. Um, so for someone who is trans or from my community to say, oh, you should look at this, it's actually really good. Or even with the caveat of, oh, halfway through, there's this really iffy scene, but you can skip over that. H having those kind of um, caveats and interactions and being able to build that into SIB as an interface, I think was uh, a really interesting process. I think what you're saying, what you're saying there, Finn, is it's really poignant as well, because so much of our community is, you know, queer and especially transness, is passed person to person and if we're not archiving this and if we're not if we are not the ones who actually put this down somewhere um it, it gets lost right um i i don't know many trans people who don't have lists on their phones of like specifically queer trans books films artists name it and they've got it right and it, it really shines a light on how important something like SIB is, not just as a safe space for us to use, but as an archive for the future, because these things will get lost. Um, and it's so important for, as everything is becoming digitalized and narratives are not just being formed, but they're being solidified into society. This is what trans experience is right now in 2020. And not a single trans person has said that or like believes it. It's this, the cis perception of what we're doing. You, you know, I mean, the phrase goes, right? If you're not at the table, you're not part of the conversation. And like, if we're not guiding this narrative and we're not like archiving our own experience, creativity and joy, it's just gonna disappear. And it's like super important, like something that is said. Yeah, I think that's, I think it's, yeah, it's really, it's really clear to, it really became clear to us how important it was just to connect people to this kind of thing. Um, I want to start thinking around like some of the design decisions that we made and something that um, Cami brought up during um, the presentation and one of the questions that's actually come in from the participants is around um, this notion of a genderless voice. So we made a lot of very particular decisions in um, while, tra while centering trans joy and tra connecting users to transmedia was a clear decision at one point and we moved forward. There were other decisions that were maybe a bit more nuanced and we had to move through them. Um, and one of those is around the voice. And um, one of the questions that's been asked is why does Q, the genderless voice, have to have a vocal range that covers both cis male and cis female ranges in order to be acceptable as non-binary? Um, and there's a reply here from Lucy as well that says, I feel like the expectation to be androgynous or genderless is still a huge problem around non-binary identities, even in trans and non-binary spaces. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to speak a little bit more about um, the considerations we made around the voice and the way we chose to kind of allow that to be very fluid, randomized at some points. 
Yeah, I think I'd, I'd really like to speak on that because I think that Q was a really interesting starting point for us because I think it's one of those things that you, like I heard about it, I looked at it, I played around with the voice interface and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then the more that I thought about it and the more that we talked about it um, within the project space, I was like, oh, actually, this doesn't really do anything for trans users. Um, so the actual, the actual product, it, it's, a, it's an interface, either uh, the Google Voice interface or Alexa. So it really is just um, a different voice on top of the same system, which obviously negates all of um, the things that Cami was saying about trans users having specific needs around privacy and not only in terms of representation. Um, so I think that was one thing that doesn't work about Q. And I think also when it comes to actual voice, if you, if you listen to Q, which you can on, on the website, you can, you can let it say something. Um, it doesn't really sound, I mean, I think this is the thing that we got to. There is no one way that trans people sound. There is no, um, in the same way that there's no one way that women sound or that men sound, because vocal like range is, is defined by the physical factor of the thickness of your vocal cords. Um, and that isn't something that's... Um, so when you say, oh, this is a genderless voice, then what if the person who does sound like that, they're, they're not genderless, they don't exist in this, in this ungendered space, um, in the same way that some people who may say that they're agender or don't identify those spaces uh, within a gendered space, they might not sound like that. So what are you saying to a user when you designate this other? Um, and I think when we started thinking about how we want Sib to sound, there, there was an element that we did discuss about whether we wanted Sib to, to sound human at all, whether we wanted to be quite clear like, yeah, this is a robot, you're speaking to a robot, so they're not going to sound like a person. Um, and we discussed that quite extensively. I think when we settled on, um, actually, well, we used Cherub for, uh, for Sib's voice, which was really lovely. Um, for the, but we wanted to give users um, a choice of what they wanted the, the Sib to sound like. Because I think people want to converse not only with someone who sounds like them, but maybe doesn't sound exactly like them. I think in, in the same way when it comes to personability, we also talked about like, well, what if Sib just mirrored your voice? Which for me would be really, really a really odd experience. I don't want Google to sound like me. Um, and we, we thought about the kind of, um, uh, the kind of traits or vocal um, like flourishes that we wanted Sib to have and having those integrated into different voices. Um, mm -hmm. And we thought about, well, what do we want? Do we want them to sound authoritative if they're someone who's giving us information? If they're giving us conversational data, is there a certain uh, way or nuance to the way that that interface speaks that we want to associate with? And I think it's all these considerations that Q, that Q just doesn't take into into account. It it doesn't have a, a structural reconfigurement, and in some ways, it it doesn't even really function as a genderless voice in terms of appealing to trans users because. What, from our discussions and from Cami's research, we know that trans users don't want that. Um, so I think, yeah, it was a starting point for what we ended up developing within SIB, and I think where SIB has the potential to go, um, especially in terms of not only what the person or the, the voice sounds like, but also the kind of language they use. Um, and the same thing with having uh, SIB call the user Hun or having these uh, personal nicknames because we talked about like how that comes into queer language and if that's something that the user wants to engage with. Um, I've talked a lot now, I'm worried. I don't know if you guys have anything else to say about that. I, I do wanna say, um, I know in the video um, uh, it's asked, I want a trans femme voice, but I do wanna say I just have my voice. Um, and I think ideally it would be there would be a, a list of different voices and then you could attribute um, whatever pronouns you wanted onto that voice, right? Um, because yeah, I, I just have a, I have my voice and I happen to identify as trans femme. I identify as a woman, right? Um, 
And so giving users the opportunity to have a, to choose what their, their, um, their voice assistant sounds like, um, I think not only like connects them in a way that makes them feel included or represented, but also I think that in itself is trans joy. Like why not have, like I love sci-fi. I've always loved sci-fi. And the thought of just like having a trans AI blew my mind. Um, and I think half the fun of it is is just being able to kind of pick and choose uh, how you want to characterize it. And um, it's very personable. Um, yeah. I and that's actually yeah. what I've got like written down in like my sort of like maybe mention things notes is just like it's interesting um sort of how easy a lot of this stuff is by just giving someone the choice right so instead mm -hmm. of having sort of female male voice one voice two voice three four, you know it they see like you know maybe uh because we're deciding this you know as trans people and like you know uh, with a group of people it seems so obvious well like why not allow someone to pick a, a voice that you don't gender and then they can gender it themselves or they can skip past it right ultimately like i mean that's like part of user experience in like good ux is that it gives people choices to manipulate um the thing they're using to make most sense to them and I think what was interesting about Q in like a lot of ways is it's um, it's sort of this idea that one size fits all, you know, like it completely strips mm -hmm. any idea of choice and also strips any, you know, uh, by sort of opening up a choice and, you know, the only choice they do have, sorry, is, is the actual voice, but then they place this like with uh, cis people at the forefront of it. So the people who they're then making it for are then othered in a really bizarre way. Like why, like, it, it seems so obvious to me that you just don't include like female male, just drag something, find a voice you like and then go from there. And these like bizarre sort of decisions to um, to sort of place cis people first in this is, um, I, I found Q very interesting. Um, and um, I was like, while well, Finn was part of the team that was looking for trans media, I was part of the team that was sort of designing the beginning part of the of SIB, um, which includes all these choices. And ultimately, any time we got stuck as a team, like one person didn't want to gender it, one person did want to gender it. We kind of you see that there's an issue that this is not a one size fits all option. So you then like give the option back to the user, right? You just say like, well, I don't know. Why don't you decide? And it's 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 sort of that simple. And it it was interesting, like that these this wasn't a difficult these weren't difficult discussions that we were having. It's uh, you know, they just felt very typical, and it does make you think, like, you know how how are these things being missed and you know it's obviously that when you don't have like trans or if you don't have like a diverse group of people like designing these things from the off not as an afterthought afterwards like these are the sort of decisions that get missed and then replicated again and again and again as tech you know as technology builds and um you know, people create version point two, three, four, five. You know, until we're living in a house of Alexa, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And there were there are lots of sort of other design decisions that um, I think you know we were going down. And um, what I one thing that I wanted to mention because I saw it in the questions as well. I know I'm not answering necessarily, but. Um, you know, there are features that we want to include in the future. So uh, I think maybe it's good to disclaim a sieve as it is now is not a finished product. Um, it's mm -hmm. sort of, this was where we got to in a week. Um, yeah, we had a week. And yeah, it was not a long time. <laughs> yeah. And um, one of them was really important for me because a big conversation 
that we were having and Kami has stated from their, from their um, research is that safety and privacy are really important. And I love this idea that someone takes my pronouns and takes my maybe uh, the name that I go by, right? Um, but I think it's really important to state that not everyone is um, out, not everyone is, or you might be out, but you might be in an like unsafe space. So, you know, there were conversations around having this idea of like a private and a sort of public and private um, setting that would flip between, you know, one that kind of kept you very anonymous being just like, hey, what would you want to look at? And one that sort of like gives, you know, says your name, says your pet name, says your pronouns. And again, it's all of these sort of decisions that I think... Um, the team were really reflected in um, mm. as trans people. And, you know, that that conversation wouldn't happen if, if you did, like, you know, if it was just left to sort of maybe cis het people, because like, why would they, like, you know, they, they yeah, they, they're not put in, a, like a normal space can be very unsafe for trans people. And we sort of know that inherently, right? And like, yeah. I think otherwise we've, we've covered most things that I was talking about very important for me and a feature that I really want to push for the future. But definitely this disclaimer that SIB is not done yet and there's definitely room for more features around things like safety. Yeah, I think one of the questions that's actually come in from Lucy is um, just be, like kind of just been answered. They were asking, you know, could the could a user choose a voice could, and i think this is the thing is this is a prototype and to understand that mm -hmm. if we were to continue to develop this further um we would and it, we would, one of the other questions is has has any ai developer approached us about about pushing this any further and the answer is is no um but we would love to so yeah um and if you know another, anyone <laughs> yeah if you know anyone um there's also <laughs> another question here from um from andrew uh, just a, a last little point about the voice um which they would love to hear more about the importance of um, the character of voice one, um, where a familiar and personal feeling is present in user interactions. And further, what were your discussions around this when developing the prototype? And I know we've kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but I think we discussed that kind of making it feel as joyous to engage with was really, really important to us. And um, we were limited in the, limit, the limitations of the actual workshop with who was there. So we chose the wonderful of SIP. Um, because we could only record it in a specific way. So, Cherub, I don't know if you want to speak any more about that at all. Yeah, um, I I have a lot of ideas buzzing around my head when I was like, okay, how am I going to present my voice in a way that I uh, I, I I don't know. It was it was really difficult because um, when it comes to like pet names, what and also. Oh God, I'm like a scatterbrain right now, but I, okay. I wanted the, one of the, I wanted whatever voice it was, right? Whatever dialogue we use or wh whichever voice, um, to feel like you were connected with like some kind of queer elder or like a, a, a close friend you've known for a while. And with those relationships, you have certain um, you know, with any relationship you've had with someone for a long time, there's like inside jokes and pet names. And I wanted to emulate something like that. Um, specifically with like queerness in mind, because I think queer people, we, queer and trans people, we just have different relationships with people. We have different relationships with ourselves, um, with our families, with everything. And that, um, I wanted, so yeah, I, 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 of course that's hard, right? Because everyone's different. Um, so I think like the way in which I, like my candor and, and the words I chose is, is just kind of like, here's what it could be like, you know? Um, I, I think also when we were, even before we, we had picked Cherub as the voice, when we were thinking about scripting certain parts of the text, I remember when uh, one of the first things was that Kami asked um, Cherub to write sort of a list of the kind of attributes um, that she might want uh, a voice AI to have. 
And I remember one of the things that stuck with me and I kept kind of coming back to was you you saying you wanted it to be like your gay auntie. Oh, <laughs> which, yeah. You know yeah, what which I, mean? I Which I loved. And I yeah. Think it, it was, was um, yeah. that personable and um, so it, it still had the element of like, you can trust what this person is saying and they yeah. care for you um, and they want to provide you with things. Um, and within that, that queer space of specific language types and um i think like you're saying like the relationships that queer people form with each other um mm -hmm. can function in in a multiple different ways and having like like we said about trans people and queer people passing on information to each other like um like movies and films and different types of music of like oh have you heard this you should look at this and we wanted to have that within this sib character and i think even that's even through the different voice options um we wanted that element to remain um so even if it isn't cherub's voice and there's another voice or has different uh, nuances to, to still keep those um those core values to the way that sib sounds and oh, yeah. interacts with the user um, yeah yeah because without sort of minimizing it ultimately it was just a bit of fun as well like Absolutely. I, mean, I know that's I know that's so simple but um I don't think I've ever had a conversation with like Siri or Alexa where I'd be like laughing right um, yeah. um and why the hell not like literally why not like why is this so still we are social um, beings <laughs> we it, just yeah are, you know? know even from a design point of view it you know I I don't have a very good concentration span, but I stayed completely 100% concentrating, like, you know, the whole week because it was just fun. Like, it was funny, it was fun, and I was just roaring with laughter half the time. And I think that's, um, that's why it's almost, it's so important to have, when you're working within this participatory design, not only was Cherub our user tester, but having trans people within the design team and the creation team meant that, mm. like, like it was super fun and it i think especially because we chose chose to center trans joy and to talk it meant that we were inherently talking about things that we loved and i mean when when the video showed earlier like we were kind of silently losing it because like, oh, I'm, really, I'm really really proud of this project and watching the film makes me happy because hearing cherub and me talk makes me happy <laughs> um and like us even in this kind of pretend version where i'm a fake user like it it makes me happy and i think we that is an element that doesn't really come into play with any other voice interface and to be able to do that in a space that is that considers privacy and safety and also causes i think was it was genuinely like mind-blowing like cherub said and i think yeah. when it came to considering safety and privacy of trans users i think it was also really important for us to be able to maintain that personability and maintain the functionality of SIB, even if the user wanted didn't want to give any information, so that you could be entirely anonymous and still use all of the functions of SIB. Whereas with something like Alexa or Google, you if you say you don't agree to the terms and conditions, you just you just can't use it. It becomes yeah. inaccessible to you. Um, and so we wanted to keep it in a really open space where all of the all users could engage without giving any information. Yeah. and would still maintain that human well not human ai but that personal connection um yeah and there's and definitely that was, something that, really valuable. that i'd like to follow on from that if there's time because i do think it's really important to like mention that like while we were having fun um the transparency around you know data and privacy was um like they were very serious talking points and another thing that i think was really important and not you know, it was not on the sort of lighthearted side was um, the terms and conditions that we had at the very beginning. Um, that was really, um, I mean, almost like 100% inspired by Daniel Braithwaite Shirley's um, work in which they get people to, um, A, they're transparent about what this space, uh, their, their work is um, around trans black experience and in their work it makes it clear that this is a space for trans black uh individuals and 
you have to agree to that. And I think that was, that's really important. And mm -hmm. something they said that I think stuck with me throughout, um, especially as like a white trans person um, and where that privilege sort of ho uh, is, is that Danielle says they, to have trans black design process, you need to have trans black people designing it. There's actually no other, Absolutely. you can't just follow a, a cheat sheet here's a structure Absolutely. white people now you can pretend that you're a black trans person that's not how it works mm -hmm. and it was something that i felt really um and i think um quite a few people did um really strongly mm -hmm. about is actually being really transparent not just with the data and privacy but transparent with who we are like who the founders mm -hmm. of civ were mm -hmm. um especially as well we did have like people of color within the team um there were no black trans people present within the design process mm -hmm. and i i think if you're stating that this is a trans this is a trans ai bot that's a safe space for trans people but you are missing what is the most vulnerable like sector of our community mm -hmm. like are you an inclusive space Though I would like to, ca and I think we we tried our hardest to caveat that and like, you know, um, disclaimer it. And as we said, like, aren't going to move forward, but not, you know, there's that balance, right? You don't want to like create tokenism. It's about truly creating an in, in, mm -hmm. like an inclusive space. But just to finish off my monologue, um, <laughs> I do think that also what was really interesting or funny for me is that we would get caught up, you know, when you're trying to create your, like a whole set of really inclusive QTs, trying to create an inclusive safe space, you end up getting caught on questions that I don't think other design teams are getting caught up with for a whole afternoon. You know, the wording of how to say, we're not, we don't have black people in our team. The wording of, oh, do we use this or do we use that? And then we get caught up on these, in these huge sort of quite um, philosophical questions in the end around a single feature that mm -hmm. I don't think if you were a cishet team, you would even consider in the first place. So there's that balance that had to be have struck. to as trans people, we have to consider, as, as marginalized people collectively, we have to consider these things. Mm -hmm. um, this at white people just don't like they, like they never have to consider these things. But I'm trying to I guess I'm trying to say having... that sometimes inclusivity is that utopia that maybe is not always you don't get it yeah. first time right and it, it's you yeah. know you make it and then you go back and we were getting stuck on some of these like sections just because and I th yeah we wanted think, to make it I think inclusive. What was almost it was it was a privilege of problems like. And I mean, we oh. did. There were moments in the in the week where we did stop and think, like, like yeah, this is really tricky what we're trying to sort out at the moment. But how wonderful is it that we're thinking about these mm. things mm -hmm. in something that we're creating? And I think that's why having having a team with multiple trans people on on it with multiple different experiences and from all different walks of life, like, meant that it wasn't oh, this is the token trans person on our team who's going to talk for the community and tell us everything we need to know. Um, it meant that we could talk on a really human level and also have multiple, have these multifaceted discussions because we were able to talk from our, our own experience but also on a community and personal level. Um, and I think that was so valuable having a team that was predominantly trans people and centered a trans voice, obviously for a trans project. And that's genuinely something that I've never experienced before in a creative world in a like in a social means it's it was completely new for me and it was it was wonderful like and that's why I'm, I'm really proud of the work we've done because i think we were able to produce something that was really authentic to the discussions and the, and the creative team and like it makes me really excited about where it could go and about what this project could develop into and i think um like a final note on um joe mentioned very briefly, uh, Daniel's work and the uh, process of kind of creating terms and conditions. And what was really my like eye opening for me when she took, uh, when we talked about their work process 
was going that that exists from the group like the people giving her money if she, if they've been con uh, commissioned the work process of participatory design all the way through to the finished product and I had never really considered before that you can set terms for your users in the same in a digital space in the same way that you use in physical space and that if people are taking advantage of that or are using it in a way that doesn't fit in with the ethics or dynamics of that project you can just you can hard code in for it to kick them out and i think even in my own practice even when i've been making work about trans people centering queer voices i have never considered the idea that i could just tell people tell cis people not to be there <laughs> um, which would seem like a really simple thing but even it's like we're hard coded to to consider um the majority user even if that's not our focus um and i think this was a really incredible opportunity for myself definitely to like think about well what actually is a queer centered trans centered pra practice what does that look like from the really big stuff to the really teeny itty bitty stuff and it has affected the way that i design now um and like the kind of projects that i'd like to be in in more of um there's a there's a question here anonymous question here um saying that they agree with what we're saying, but they personally don't see the importance of having vo a range of voices that are labelled as... Um, that, that are labelled as mask, femme, cis, trans, as it could be really easily read as stereotyping instead of representation or familiarity. I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that a little bit. Cherub, you're uh, nodding quite oh, seriously. Yeah, I agree with that one, 100%. Um, and I think... I, I think that, like... Hmm... <laughs> Can I, can I hear the question one more time? Yeah. So okay. um, they personally don't see the importance of having a range of voices that are labeled as mask, femme, cis, trans, as it could yeah. easily be read as stereotyping instead of representation or familiarity. Exactly. And I think that's why, um, in, uh, that's why I hope that uh, the iterations that, we, that, that are made of SIB, you have a range of voices that are listed in numerical order, and then whatever you want to attribute to that voice, um, it's entirely up to you. So it, I, it could be, you know, voice one can have, you know, whatever pronouns you want to put on it. Because I, I, I do agree. I, I think that um, kind of like what I was saying about the the, the, the dialogue, right, is that, um, you know, my voice isn't isn't trans them, right? I just have my voice and I happen to have these other identities um, that go alongside uh, that. They're not, they're not the same thing, right? Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I totally, totally agree. With and I think, I think within the project and within the, the video, when, um, when the user says like oh i want a trans femme voice i think that could just as easily not be part of the that actual conversation mm -hmm. you you as a user can attribute whatever you want to that specific voice mm -hmm. i think we that's why they're labeled kind of voice one voice two or voice three we didn't want to specifically attribute those things but you as a user would be able to attribute those things mm -hmm. so if i as a trans masculine person want to pick that voice and idea as a trans masculine person so that i feel more comfortable using that voice ai space um then that is the space for it i think we will it may not have come across but we didn't really want to uh specify this is what assists this th like voice a is a cis voice voice b is not whatever um and I think it it also tie, segues quite nicely into something else I wanted to mention, which was that I think one of the really important parts of this project and what what made it really click for me during during the project was this thing of like for me right at this current moment I barely interact with voice AI it's built into my phone I don't really use it um, it's not a huge part of my life but the the money that's currently being shoveled into the tech industry for them to to develop this it's it's the chances are it's going to end up in everything um and in the internet of things and having everything in your house connected like Cher, um or joe was saying like a house full of alexa 
um, is a very real possibility in the future. And if that, um, if as we think is going to happen, that's going to all happen through a voice interface. If the same voice that talks to me in the morning and my alarm clock and reads me the news, then goes on my phone and tells me my commute to work and then tells me traffic updates, if that's all one interface, it becomes far more important for that to be uh, an accessible space um, for trans people and for all sorts of other users because it's going to be built into everything. Um, and it's, it's really valuable to, to be approaching these projects now, because like Joe said, it's, yeah. it's gonna be version one that goes into version four, that goes into version 40. Mm -hmm. And if, if these are thing, if these kind of badly <laughs> made decisions that affect user accessibility are hard coded in at the very beginning, it's just gonna get worse. Um, and when we're, we're starting to think about well, how could this look differently? Um, and not only from a what does this sound like perspective, but in every aspect of how the voice interface functions. Um, and I think that was a really key turning point for me in thinking about like, well, what's this project actually doing? Mm -hmm. um, oh, you're muted, Andrew. Keep forgetting that I'm muted. <laughs> um, I just want to say to everyone quickly who's watching that um, we're just going to close the questions in five minutes. So like, if you have any questions that you really want to ask, just get them in now um, because we will be wrapping up relatively um, soon. So just, yeah, get your questions in. Um, there's quite a few things that, that are here. One of the questions that we've gone, that have come up a couple of times is considerations around privacy. I know that they've been answered privately, but I think it's good to also kind of bring them up. But um, um, there's a question here from River, which speaks about, um, that it's important to achieve um, privacy and inclusively standards for major VA. Um, isn't there a risk of also outing people in the name and or voice of the vocal assistant is audibly recognizable? Um, I think this is something we definitely considered like privacy, what you have to disclose, what you don't. I don't know if anyone wants to just speak a little bit more about that to their question. Uh, I, um, oh. No, you go, I just yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's my turn, guys. Calm down. <laughs> um, so this was something that was really important to me. Um, my parents are watching. Um, and um, I came out to them last week, and it went really well, and I was really happy. Thank you. Um, but like when we were designing this, I wasn't out. And I was thinking, gosh, like I'd love something to say they, them, and use my name and you know whatever else but could you imagine like oh my gosh being like around family or friends or in public and this go off and you know you're all of a sudden like it's not just about you know uncomfortability obviously there's a very real sense that like this could be really dangerous this could be um um this could could break relationships you know there's there's a whole manner of like issues with like you know this idea of being out anyway which i won't get into but um yeah like i it was just something that i felt really really strongly about at the time because i wasn't ready to like i, I just didn't know how these conversations were going to go with my family i wasn't sure how these conversations were going to go with you know my friends and things and um you know i think we all know people who have been outed or there's celebrities who've been outed and it's not it's not acceptable and if we're creating some and if we're like there's two sides to that right if we're creating something for trans people that needs to you just need to make sure that they're in control of their own narrative mm -hmm. and then also their own safety my god like could you imagine like this going so it's something that for the future and like i was really um i and still am um having this sort of idea of maybe a safe or unsafe mode right where it does flip between maybe what it says how it addresses things um and it could even potentially switch into a different voice you know there's lots of different design considerations for the future that i think is really um really really relevant um, and that also goes into, I think, um, this idea of being able to, what Finn was saying, um, you can still use this if you don't want to give any of your information. Um, I think that's, that's really important in terms of like, keep, you know, safety of 
you know, creating a safe space for people who are using it. If this isn't something you're comfortable with, then why are you being forced to do it? Mm-hmm. Um, there's actually, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, Joe, but just to add to what you're saying, is there's actually an anonymous question here that ties into what you're kind of getting into that is, in what scenario would Sib need to use the user's pronouns and what would knowing the user's pronouns aff- potentially affect the way Sib behaves and communicates? So um, there's just, yeah, there's only, well, there's, uh, I promise I'll pass, pass the mic over. Um, I think two things. Um, things like pronouns and stuff, uh, I guess, it's that conversational part, right? It's being like, yeah, girl, you're going to love this. Like, um, I can't think off the top of my head why pronouns might be used, but if they are, you're not going to misgender someone, right? So there's the importance of taking that there just for user experience and so that you don't misgender someone. But from a software developer standpoint, um, you know, obviously it, there's a balance, but um, being able to collect data, not just like pronouns, but things like, oh, did you like that film? Do you like romance films? Oh, this genre is what you, oh, you didn't like that actor. What it can do is in the future, it compiles that for you to make a specific um, user interface. So technically, if I was using it for five years and you were using it for five years and we were collecting the data that was actually relevant, you know, and not selling it on to you know other people and to different com- co- like companies and things like this, my sib would be wholly different from your sib in the way that it, if I put I want to watch a rom com, it, it's going to come up with something really different to what yours would, and that again comes down to choices. Um, I think I, I I mean I'm not against data collection if it's for these sort of purposes, and I think that um, that's really like. I love it when my cookies get me, you know, it already knows I'm in Berlin when I'm Googling something or, you know, I'm, I'm not too fussed about that, but it's got to, it's got to meet that match of like, well, what are you doing with my data? Where is this going? And actually, can I delete it? You know, can I just completely go in, get rid of that? Maybe I accidentally stored something. Um, and I think that that element of transparency of seeing, cause I know this was a design dis- discussion for like later on is seeing how much data it's got about you being able to edit it and delete it and actually seeing where that why you know a little information i that goes we've taken this and this is how it's going to influence and then you go oh no 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 i don't like that because maybe you didn't like the actor but you still want to see some films from them because you love to hate them right um so and that's really that's uh, from a kind of software developer standpoint that's why you take data from people and I think from a from a user perspective, I think we've wanted when we were talking about trans joy, I think one of the most joyful things is is being recognized by members of your community in terms of uh, of validation of people using your pronouns um, and your name and referring to you in terms that you uh, you identify with. So I think in terms of like why we chose to include pronouns at all or any kind of identifiers, which we did have quite extensive conversations about, I think, there's something wonderful about being recognized in terms that, uh, that you identify with. And I mean, in, in the same way that when my friends use my name or my pronouns, especially when it was quite new, it, it felt good every single time. It continues to feel good to be, to be recognized as who I am. And I think that's why we chose to have it, because I think there is equally an argument to be like, well, we don't need this at all. But I think then you, you do slip back into into what's wrong with Q, which is that many, most people don't exist in a genderless space. Gender is part of our identities and it's complex and many people want to be recognized for the compl- complexity. And maybe it wasn't obvious in the video, but you don't have to do any of this as well. Like, you literally yeah, this is can a, just a like full leave user. it blank. And it doesn't, if I pick voice one, decide that it's trans male, I can then, you can delete that or you can just move past it. You can pick voice one. You don't have to put your pronouns in. You don't have to put that. You can literally leave like sib genderless, yourself genderless, and it's still going to work in the same way. It's just not going to call you hun. That's literally it. <laughs> um, and also, things like that. There's also another question here when we're speaking about like um, how we get access to these things and how we move through the device that I just want to touch on quickly. Um, it's an anonymous question and it says, hi, great stuff. I think access to this transmedia 
voice-assisted technology is really important, like you've stated, especially trans experiences that are working class and cannot get through through academic routes. And I think this is something a couple of people have touched on that perhaps ideas around transness are sometimes accessed through this very academic way. Someone mentioned Judith Butler before. Um, but yeah, the, the idea of this being to connect people in a different way that doesn't do this mode of discourse. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to touch on that at all. Um, I'd really like to, um, just, just really quickly. I think that that's why, I think voice interface is a really interesting way to, to start talking about that, about access to information, because um, we're, we're stepping into a thing where there's the larger conversation about access to information in both an educational sense and, a, not, and sort of a casual sense of interaction. But for when you start thinking about Google or Alexa or these things and their, in terms of their accessibility, so like uh, Alexa, if it's not built onto your phone, you need a specific device and that device costs money. And with the Google equivalent, it's, it's still on your phone and that phone costs money and, and all of these things. But when, whether we think that's going to change as voice interfaces becomes more interactive with our objects. Um, but I think that we, in the same way that we wanted to create a, a space where you wouldn't have to give um, SIB, uh, as a user, you wouldn't need to give them any information. I think having it just as something that's web accessible um, is something that we discussed and I think is really important because, I mean, lots of conversations anyway about the internet and um, accessibility to, to information, like I said, but having, having it as something that you wouldn't need to purchase or buy or buy something in order to access um, was, was definitely something that's important to me. I think so often, we, I mean, we talked extensively around the idea of like pink dollar and companies selling things specifically to trans people because they, they think of us as a market as opposed to a, a human group of people. Um, and we wanted to avoid that. Having it as, as something that is free and could potentially just work through your computer or, um, I mean, we had conversations, uh, voice flow, the application that we used to actually build uh, the conversational flow. Um, when we started the project, the only way that you could you could um, access that you could output it was either to put over Amazon or Google as an interface, which obviously goes against a lot of the things that we were talking about in terms of structural integrity of SIB. And um, now, actually, Andrew, I know that you were in conversation with them, and now we're able to output it as a standalone device, so it doesn't have to integrate with those other um, those other systems that I think are much more. Uh, have a potential to be a lot more inaccessible um, for people who aren't uh, who are working class and may not have money or expendable income. Like I think it's quite important. So like we didn't want to sell this. It, we wanted to keep it accessible and available for trans people because like many members of of our community are disadvantaged and disadvantaged specifically because of their transness. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I am. I'm just. I'm quite conscious that we're um, running over time and stuff. So I think we kind of need to to wrap things up slightly. But I just want to quickly run through some of the comments that we've got. Um, through. Um, we've tried to answer a lot of the questions, but we have some comments here. Um, so there's a comment from Lucy that says, "I love how you included Sib asking the user for consent to call them Hun. It feels really queer and personal to me. That's really lovely. We definitely. That was something we thought about quite a lot. And um, there's a couple of comments here that I'm not sure what they were directly in relation to, but um. So, uh, Lucy also mentioned that um, they've heard of, I heard of, does the dog, dog die equivalent page for representation of queer and trans people in specific movies? I actually didn't know what, what does the dog die was, but Finn brought it up to me in the planning of the um, device. And it's like a really interesting thing where you can disco discover all the different things that have happened um, or potentially could happen in a film. You know, someone does someone die and they, Finn, correct me if I'm wrong, they now include misgendering as one yeah, of the... Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a list of trigger warnings potentially or things that uh, people might not want to view, um, such as death of pets. <laughs> um, but now misgendering is included as one of the, um, one of the sections. And I, I do believe that it is, uh, it's upheld by users. So you can input information and then that gets double checked before it's put on the site. Um, Great. 
Um, yeah, there's a, there's a comment here from Steph, which saying that it was a great point. Um, was worried about this potentially outing people. I'm sure that's in relation to something we spoke about a little bit before. Um, and there's another comment here from Lucy, a couple of comments from Lucy. Mirroring your voice in a conversation with Voice AI for voice training purposes might also be interesting. That's really nice. And um, in my headset. Um, inclusivity is like design, a work in process and iterative. Being able to question yourself and your work environment is key. Um, and that's, yeah, Lucy, those are really lovely comments. Thank you so much. You've really given so much to the conversation here. There's an anonymous question here, which we'll try to, which is a bit longer. So we'll try to reply to that um, in text. And Lucy has asked again, um, how can we get information on how to get involved in the future Trans Centre project list? This was so cool. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, if you follow Femmes Internet on Instagram, CCI, um, us, this is the beginning of this project for us, and it really, we really, really want to develop it further. Um, so yeah, just stay in, like, stay in touch with us, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Um, Femmes Internet have a, a mailing list you can sign up to. Um, um, but yeah, we'll be posting our socials. And if there are any future opportunities, say if this course was to run again, or if there are any uh, future workshops, we'll be publicizing them quite um, a lot before they happen. So you'll be able to sign up and be involved. Um, I just want to say a massive, massive, massive thank you to everyone who has listened today, and especially to everyone who's been involved. Um, this was an extremely rewarding project to be a part of. And um, yeah. Could I just shed a, shed a tear. Um, and this, yeah, it's just been a fantastic conversation. And, and thank you so much for, for bringing everything you have to it. And Cherub, thank you, especially for being here at this time in the morning. Uh, it's so appreciated. Uh, your contributions are so, so important. So thank you so, so, so much. Um, and from a, from a student perspective, I'd also like to thank Andrew and Cami. They did a yeah. really excellent job of uh providing and curating this space and also are both very 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 talented in their fields and i absolutely wouldn't have existed without their the well. um, thank you very much so That's... yeah y'all are wonderful oh. um just to let everyone else know who's watching um you can access thank more... you all so much thank... sorry Carrie. <laughs> didn't mean to interrupt you um just to let you all know if you're watching, you can access some of the resources by clicking the menu icon at the top left corner of the Slido window. Um, and there you can find a link to the prototype, uh, more info on CCI, more info on feminist internet. Um, yeah, I think, I, think that's, I think that's everything for us today. There's also um, a survey that should have popped up and you can answer that as well if you, you want to give us some feedback about what you've, um, what you've heard and what you've listened to. But otherwise, um, thank you so, so, so much for tuning in um, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you.